Thank you very much for coming along this evening. I'm going to invite the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Pillay, to say some words of welcome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's, a, it's a real joy this evening to have you here at five o'clock on a Wednesday when Mr. Danny Boyle and Professor, um, our Professor of Reading and Communication will, will realize that on a Wednesday we don't have anything timetabled and it's pretty, pretty bare with everyone gone away. So it's wonderful to see the chapel full. Um, especially this evening to have two extraordinary people Professor Frank Cottrell Boyce needs, needs no introduction. He's our professor, professor of reading and communication. But with him today is Mr. Danny Boyle, who is an extraordinary director, and we all are still reeling from the effects of his work at the recent Olympics. Now, who can forget that? We've seen many Olympic ceremonies over the years, haven't we? Especially people my age. But this is truly unforgettable. It was British in spirit and in truth. It was something that we will never forget. And I think the two things that stand out in my mind over above the superb direction and the surprises in it was the fact that it was truly British and not just the pomp and the ceremony and the splendor, which we in Britain do well in any case. It was British because it really captured something about the history and the literature of this place. I'd like to think that because Danny Boyle and Frank Cottrell Boyce are from the north, it was truly representative of a much bigger slice of Britain. But the other thing that struck me and will always, be, uh, will always remember is that it was truly literate and literary. It, was, it captured something more than just ordinary scripting not just the Blake that gave it structure behind the scenes, but it really captured what we in this country are. So it's a great honor to have Danny Boyle and Frank Cottrell Boyce. It's a great honor to have them here with us. And this, I gather, is the first time he's reflected in public about his work at the Olympics. Jane Davis, who leads and heads the read, the reader organization, is going to introduce our speakers. The reader organization is an important part of the life of this university. In fact, it's the only university, I think, that has actually mainstreamed reading as part of a faculty of education. And we're very proud of that. Jane Davis. I must remember to get higher heels. Um, I'm not really going to introduce Danny and Frank because most of you will know quite a lot about them already. You will certainly know their work. The thing I want to tell you about them is, is in a way the root of that work. Danny attended St. Mary's Rome Catholic primary school. I bet you didn't know that. Frank attended St. Bartholomew's, I believe. It was in Rainhill. And those who were here last year will have heard Frank talking about Sister Paul at St. Bartholomew's and her profound effect on him as a reader. And these days, we'd have to add, as an imaginative and creative being. So partly I, I just want to stand here to say thanks to Sister Paul. Danny mentioned three great teachers from his primary school, from St. Mary's. Mr. Waldron, Mr. McNally, and Mrs. Wade. I don't know if any of those people are still with us, but I think we should give them a round of applause. And those first year student teachers sitting in the um, VIP seats here today will know because I, I told you last week in the opening lecture that Frank invited Danny here today to meet you because these two guys think that nothing is as important for the future as what you take 
to those primary schools. Make some more men like this. Thank you. Here we go. Right. So, so I'm Danny Boyle, and he's, as I understand it, a professor, Frank Cottrell Boyce, which I've never heard him refer to him before. As I'm a bit intimidated now, so I'm let, going to let Frank lead it as a professor. He should be able to. Um, <laughs> Is mine switched on? Yes. Yes. Can you all hear me? No, it's not. It's not switched on. Go on, push that. Yeah. Technical. So no. we, so we did. Yeah, so, there was a, so the way we did the opening ceremony, I, did, any, did, did all of you see it? Yeah. So if you didn't, a, just to plug it, the, we've done a DVD of it, <laughs> which is the real reason we're here. Nothing to do with reading. It's so you buy copies of the DVD. No, we've done a DVD of it. The BBC has, actually, and they'll get all the money. Um, and it's 30 quid, but it's like eight DVDs with all the sport and the opening ceremony, and we've polished it up, like some of the television coverage, and also done a fold-out that we'll talk about later, which is quite interesting of kind of some of the cultural references that are in it. And um, um, so if you... It, 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 yeah, it's a great Christmas present anyway. But um, I should stop <laughs> talking about that anyway. So, um, yeah, so, so we did the opening ceremony. And the way we started is they... Listen, they asked me to do it. And the reason they asked me is because I'd won an Oscar. So it was like, oh, that's a good idea. We, you know, they think, oh, that's a good idea. We'll get him to do that. But actually, what I did then is I asked him to do it with me. And he, although he's a professor, hasn't won an Oscar. <laughs> I'll just point that out. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, we, and we also asked a couple of designers who were called Mark Tilsley and Sutter at the Lab. Yeah. And this musician, Rick Smith, from a band called Underworld. And various other people. And we created a group of people and we wanted to work as a team on it. And um, that's really where, why we're here to speak today, is because basically what we did is we had a room where we'd meet every day, and this is for like nine months we met. We had the most amazing job, and we just said, we asked ourselves three questions. It's where do we come from, what are we, and where do we hope to be, yeah. or what do we hope to be? And we asked ourselves those three questions, and we just sat around and talked about that. And we did it through... Well, through... Sh I mean, it's great that Jane mentioned Sister Paul, because what she used to do on a Friday afternoon was that, she, if we were good, she would read to us. And that was a fantastic thing. We would sit on the floor, and just sort of reconfiguring the room like that felt amazing. It just turned what was a workaday classroom into this sort of treat place, and it was fantastic. And those first nine months, when we, before we started having to make decisions or work out how we were going to do things, felt very much like that. We were just sticking our favourite things on the wall, yeah. favourite quotations, reading each other bits and things, and yeah. finding poems and bits of films and bits of music, and, and yeah. just putting this sort of big scrapbook together yeah. of stuff that we loved. Because it's weird. There's not much... As a director, when you like direct the actors in a play, you have this exercise. When they, when they first come together, it, it's quite... Uh, kind of, it can be a bit, you know, everybody's a bit intimidating, and you need to do exercises to break the ice. And you do this one exercise called common culture. So I would break you into a group of like 10 of you, and you go off there, and you have to come back, and it, in the next five minutes, within five minutes, you have to present to the other groups as much common culture that you all know. The only stipulation is all 10 of you must know it, must yeah. know it, and you've got to present it back to us, and it's terrible. What we all have in common is really, really, it's a really terrible lesson. It's really thin. It basically boils down to usually the national anthem and a bit of the start of uh, Our Father, a prayer, yeah. or something like that. It's really thin what we all know together. And so, one, but one of the things you get by working in a group and, is that you start to share what you don't know and you begin to give stuff to people, yeah. right? So, we, as part of this process, what we did is we went off, this is without Frank, we went off and we did this play, because we knew we were going to be on the Olympics for two years, the, the group of us, the, the ones who were like the two designers and the musician, we went off to do a play at the National Theatre, and we did an adaptation, which I've been working on with another writer for years, of Frankenstein. And we did that, and it was, like, it was a terrific success, and it was great fun to do, and it really refreshed us, and it allowed us to try out. And we said to people, we were doing Frankenstein at the National Theatre as a, a warm-up act for this 
thing, which frightened them because they thought they were going to be uh, reanimated monsters in the opening ceremony and things like that, so they were a bit worried about it. But it allowed us to try a sequence at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which was one of our main sequences. And we had a little sequence like that at the beginning of Frankenstein. And, it met, and Frank, when he heard that, gave me one of his references that I didn't know about, which was? A book called Pandemonium which is a book that was written by a, a filmmaker in the, in the war called Humphrey Jennings. He's an amazing person. And he made these propaganda films in the Second World War, films with titles like London Can Take It and Speak for Britain and stuff like that. But he compiled this book, this astonishing book called Pandemonium, which is like a movie. When you hold it in your hand, you can almost feel it buzzing. And it was about the Industrial Revolution. And it was it, but it wasn't a written book. It was a found book. It was bits of newspaper, bits of poetry, bits of diary bills of lading, technical details, just all cut together and put in a time sequence. So it's like, it's like a film, it's like a film that could never be made of the Industrial Revolution. And someone had given me this book, well in fact they'd lent me this book years before, and I'd loved this book, and they'd given it back. So I said to Danny, you're doing Frankenstein, it's all about electricity and you know, bringing bodies to life, and, and what I remembered was that, was that pandemonium was full of this. So I said to him, I'll get you a copy for Christmas. What I didn't know is that it had been out of date for about 15 years. So this present that I promised him cost me 50 quid for a paperback book. <laughs> so I was generous enough to buy it, but I wasn't generous enough not to mention it. And I posted it to you. And then I kept going, uh, I think I rang you and said, have you read that book? <laughs> what? It's going, it cost me 50 quid, just read it. <laughs> and, and it had, it, uh, and actually as it went on, Rick bought himself a copy. Yes. I remember him saying to me, I'm ashamed to tell you how much I paid for that book. And, and we, we sort of shared these images, from the, and he called these paragraphs that he put, he called them images as though it was a film. And I'm going to read you the one from the very beginning, which is where it gets its title from, which is from a poem by Milton called Paradise Lost, which is an incredibly difficult poem, huge poem about the fall of man. And it's got this paragraph at the beginning, which when I read it, I'm, I'm sure it will bring back memories of the opening ceremony, because it's amazing how close yeah. this vision that was written by a, a blind man in the 17th century, you know, dictated to his daughters in a little cottage in Oxfordshire, I think, 300 years ago, became this, or became part of this huge digital event watched by a billion people, streamed and tweeted and favorited. And this goes back to school. You know, no one would read this if a teacher didn't tell them to. There stood, a, this, is, uh, it's, this is about hell. It's about the building of the capital city of hell just after Lucifer has fallen, big stuff. There stood a hill not far whose grisly top belched fire and rolling smoke. The rest entire shone with a glossy scurf, undoubted sign that in his womb was hid metallic ore, the work of sulphur. Thither, winged with speed, a numerous brigade hastened as when bands of pioneers with spade and pickaxe armed forerun the royal camp to trench a field or cast a rampart. Um. And with impious hands they riffled the bowels of the bowels of their mother earth for treasures better hid. Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound and digged out ribs of gold. There you go. It's amazing. So, so I, I, that is the opening yeah. sequence, isn't it? I, so the, 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 how many of you how many of you have read Frankenstein? Has anybody read Frankenstein? Yeah. Probably because it's on coursework. Yeah? Or, or out of pleasure? Was it part of coursework or out of pleasure? Anyway. But that is a book. We, um, one of the themes of our opening ceremony, one of the hidden themes of our opening ceremony, is there is a thumbprint of culture that is in you. And it's unborn, probably. Frankenstein's one of them. Those of you who haven't read it, it's easy to identify because you kind of know about it. But there are other things that are hidden in our culture that you don't realise yet. And you'll find them, or they'll find you. And this book, when I read it, felt like it was one of these things that was kind of, it's waiting for you to discover. And we tried to, in the sequence in the opening ceremony, where the, which is the young people's sequence, which is probably what you related to, which is full of music and stuff like that. It's actually, there was stuff in it where we'd show a film like Kez. There'd be a bit of Kez in it. Don't, a lot of these people, like people on the front row will nod and like they know Kez. The rest of you probably won't know cares, but you will one day. Even if you don't ever discover it, it's there. It was there for you in your lifetime. And it was kind of, that's what we were trying to celebrate, was this culture that's hidden. 
in us. And it's a wonderful culture, and you're all a product of it, and you can all contribute to it as well. And you can all lay claim to it. Yeah. It belongs to you. Yeah. So, um, so that's the, that, that, that's one of the, that was one of the ideas of the ceremony. And you're, tr you're trying to... And one of, the, one of the heroes of it was a woman, J.K. Rowling, who we approached about doing it. Cause, and we ex basically what we're saying now is we explained to her she didn't want to do it because she's very, very nervous about public appearances. She's a megastar. She's an impossibly rich person. You know, obviously, it's, it's a nightmare because when you're that rich, I presume you'll, there's always a fear your kids will be kidnapped or, you know, something catastrophic can happen to you like that. So she was very, very wary about her profile. Also, she was trying to write and publish an adult novel, which is a big change from the Potter novels. And I'm sure lots of you have read the Potter novels. But we said to her that this was the idea behind the ceremony, that we wanted to celebrate, in a way, this kind of hidden culture that we all share in and actually is magnificent and is humanist and is progressive and is liberating, really. And it's, it's both tolerant and oppositional at the same time. And that we have a wonderful history of it and it's expressed in many different forms, some very popular like music, some not so popular like books, but we wanted to celebrate that. And when we began to talk to her like that, she began to come on board. And when we said we put it together with the celebration of the National Health Service, she actually then began to open up to us. And she talked about, as I'm sure you know about, that she's a champion of trying to, Im and trying to improve reading, really, and, and to, make, to make people love reading. And she, probably more than any individual, has done more to introduce the idea of reading into people's lives uh, through her books to a generation who might have been abandoned from books, from the idea of a book. Because you have so many platforms that you can read material on, disposable platforms, kind of quick release platforms, accessibility. But the idea of a book, there's something sacred about her book for her that she feels. And we said our sequence, I don't know whether you remember it, is about a child's imagination and how you fire it up, really. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it was somebody you'd never heard of. But for me, it wasn't Potter, it was Franklin W. Dixon and the Hardy Boys. There were 52 volumes of it, and I read them all. And then I moved from that, because that was sort of about detectives. Then I moved from that to another thing we'll talk about in a minute, to uh, Ian Fleming and the James Bond books. And I read all the James Bond books because they were full of sex and violence. And when you are 15, 16, it's like, and you're brought up in a very strict Catholic household, it's like unbelievable bedtime reading, you know? And you just pour through them all like that. And then you jump, it's unbelievable, you jump to Graham Greene, yeah. you know, who probably wouldn't probably interest you very much, but you begin to get these connections are made between the, 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 the writers that you read about. And yeah, and we featured Bond, we'll talk about Bond and the Queen in a minute, which is what everybody usually wants to talk about, right. about these things. But I, I, going back to the Ian Fleming thing, it's that thing about cracking open your world and giving you new worlds and different worlds. And that, for me, because one of the things that we had was like people saying, how are you going to follow China? You know, and how, what is it going to be? And, and we, we got this terrible press. That you probably were too busy even to notice. But rolling into the ceremony, people were saying terrible things about what the ceremony would be because they couldn't imagine what it could be. And they, they would kind of look at what they thought it would be and say, it's rubbish. Mm. And they had no idea what we were coming up with. So they'd say, they would say things like, oh, it'd be full of sheep and Chaz and Dave and double-decker buses and Morris dancing, and it'll be crap. And it, we had other things. But where we got that other things was from this, this shared room where we'd shared all this stuff and this reading. And, and it, it, kind of, it gives you names for other things and, 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 and gives you like a different world to, to talk about. It gives you the vocabulary. To, to imagine other stuff, to, to be surprising. Why were we so surprising? Because we were thinking in a completely different way. Because one of the things that reading really, really does for you is free you from the prison of the present. And that really came home to me when we were leaving to go to the ceremony. Because my son, who was babysitting, said to me on the doorstep as we left Adrian's house, he said, um, give us a clue who's going to like the cauldron because you can place a bet. And I said, well... Um, What's the betting? Who's, who are the bets? And he gave me this list of odds. It was like, like David Beckham was on the list. You're thinking, well, how could that be? How could you possibly think David Beckham, he's never been in a lovely bloke, never been anywhere near an Olympic Games. Why would you think he'd be like in the cauldron when you live in the same country as, 
you know, Roger Bannister and Kelly Holmes and Sebastian Coe, all these, like, fantastic people. And it's because you're so trapped in the presence, all you can think of is who's in the paper today. And, and, and of course, we came up with something that was completely surprising about the cauldron, but we weren't trying to surprise anybody. We were just thinking along a different path. And I think the, the reading and the, the sharing that we've done have taken us to a different route, really, a completely different route. Yeah. Um, and also, it gave you courage. I was going to read you this little thing, actually, because it, it was quite... I mean, you were too busy, and it didn't really bother you, and you're just braver than me anyway. But that, you would, I would see these things in the paper and think, oh, God, what if, it's, what if they're right? Where's it gone? But I had this, these things that I saw in the Daily Mail. This is going to be a huge embarrassment with the eyes of the world on us falling about with laughter, signed, fed up taxpayer. This will be the worst opening ceremony in Olympic history. I'm glad it's in London. Paul leads. <laughs> <laughs> and it lasted, that kind of vitriol lasted right into the ceremony because Giles Corrin, who's a very, very funny writer who writes for the Times, had to, had to file his report at half eight. What time did we kick off? We were kind of like, anyway, he filed his report half eight, quarter to nine, something yeah. like that. And he put it in the papers and he'd, he, he was in the stadium looking at this beautiful meadow that we'd made and... All these people herding sheep and geese, and he just wrote this piece. This is like in the night garden. This is rubbish. This is Teletubbies. This is, uh, you know, this is cost of fortune, and it's, it's every bit as bad as you thought it was going to be. And then 20 minutes later, he, he, 20 minutes later, he thought, this is the greatest night of my entire life. <laughs> this, is, this is the most fantastic thing. But he'd had to find his report. So early editions of the Times carried this report saying, well, I'll read you what he wrote. I'm in this very embarrassing position because I had to, having reported for the Times, file my report. And depending on where you live in the country, you've got a piece by me saying, this is a load of inflated nonsense, and a piece by me saying, this is the greatest night of my life. I had to file at course to, uh, uh, half past nine, and sort of midnight, because you've got to get something for those additions. And in the end, you know, I thought, what's going on? It's the night garden, it's sort of strange toddler park, and they're all running around in smocks. And then it's sort of built and built, and I filled in this slightly cynical, filed this slightly cynical thing, and I, and I filed it, and then there were toddlers doing somersaults on NHS beds, which made me cry. Then it was the jam, and I was jumping up and down on my seat as I typed. And I thought it managed the impossible task of making me feel incredibly patriotic, but also I, but I'm proud to be British for reasons that I hadn't realised, back and forth between laughter and tears, like a great Shakespearean play. If we don't win a single medal, it won't matter because we had this. <laughs> Just like... He's like, the poor guy, you know, he'd have to file this thing. It's like, well, where did you get the but, courage to know that it was going to be all right? But we, well, we started, so we started, so, so it, within, it, it's, all, it's all in books, really. Because we started with this countryside scene, which is really Jane Austen. You know, though I'm sure some of you have read Jane Austen. It's really that Jane Austen world, isn't it? Which is a kind of like it's both, it's mythical, it's real, it still exists out there, and it's historical. We know it was there. And then this, re and, and so you think that there are other writers, but, you know, the, the beauty of her writing is encapsulated in that. And obviously what we were trying to make the show about was about change. And within that, just to go back to Frankenstein for a minute, because she was right at the end of Jane Austen's Mary Shelley. She wrote it when she was 18. That is the first book of science fiction ever. That is science fiction. There hadn't been science fiction before. So Alien is from Frankenstein. It's from this 18-year-old woman, Mary Shelley. That's where it comes from. And it's, and it's like, but the change, so that, that that's just ties together something we were saying about Frankenstein. But the change that we were interested in was changing from Jane Austen to Dickens, you know, because all his work was a lot of his work was fed from stories from East London, which is the site of the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, a contemporary of his, Wilkie Collins, introduced the idea of the detective. And the detective, that was the first detective. You know, all the stuff we hook onto now, whether you watch it on telly, however you consume it, those, were, those ideas are born. That's where science fiction is born, if you like Alien. That's where detectives are born, if you like watching the stuff on television that's about detectives and they're Swedish detectives at the moment, because that's the fashion. You know, and it's all... So those were the kind of things... So we wanted to troll people like that. And so in a way, he's right, in a way. Yeah. I mean, I hate him for saying it was like Teletubbies. That's just lazy, because it was really beautifully presented. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't meant to be Teletubbies. It was actually meant to be a pastoral idyll. Um, but, 
what's accurate about it is the changing. And the changing you can reflect in books. You know, you can find it in the books. And then the big thing about the books was the, was the NHS sequence, which is about, because we had this link. Yeah, specifically about books. Yeah, because we had this link. We wanted to celebrate it. It was this great hospital, Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is just emotionally so charged because of, it deals with children with terrible illnesses. And J.M. Barry, who wrote, and it's British writers who are responsible for these extraordinary stories, which a, a huge generations grew up with, Disneyfied. But, and people don't realise they're British, but based on British books. Yeah. And the two things that you picked up on there, Peter Pan and Frankenstein, they're part of the way we think, aren't we? Aren't they? When, when science comes up with like, something new, like GM crops or something like that, there's always that debate about, is this bad? Is it Frankenstein? And, and Frankenstein, that idea that you create a monster that then destroys you, that's part of the way we think about the world. And so is Peter Pan. Peter Pan, you know, these boys who never grow up, and uh, they're, they're kind of part of how we think, they're part of our imaginative vocabulary, our emotional vocabulary, but they're both made up by writers, they both come from books and they live in the culture and they, they pop up in all kinds of different places, uh, but, the, but they were invented by somebody, right, in particular, the, and the Jay and Barry link, the, 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 I don't know if you know, but the link to the, the NHS from the Peter Pan thing was that Jay and Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, bequeathed all the royalties, which are gigantic, to Great Ormond Street Hospital. So Great Ormond Street Hospital is the gift of of Peter Pan. Yeah. And it's villains, particularly, because one of the pleasures of reading is villains, are villains. And the most amazing villains are from this extraordinary period of British writing. And then we, we, we kind of updated it by having, by depicting Voldemort, J.K. Rowling's kind of most, kind of, you know, the, probably the most famous villain in the world at the moment. And why we love those villains and why it's important that we read those books when we're the right age is that those villains they make you face something really, really frightening and realise that it can be overcome. And that, 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 that thing of like getting courage from your reading is really important. There's a great line from G.K. Chesterton, as there always is, who said that fairy stories are not there to tell you that dragons are real, they're there to tell you that dragons can be defeated. Right? Which is, I think that's a fantastic thought. And that thing of like, I think this kind of goes back to what we were saying, that we were faced with a, you know, well, particularly you, a, but you're faced with like a really, really daunting task, not just physically, not was it so big to, to, to put on something like this, but Danny's a filmmaker, and it, if you're a filmmaker, you've got to raise millions of pounds to make your next film, and your reputation is your capital, and you bet the farm, you bet everything on this opening ceremony, because if this had been rubbish, yeah. it would have been really hard for you to make another film. <laughs> Wouldn't it, though? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. You probably would never have made another film. No, probably not, no. You'd be, you'd be on quiz shows and... Yeah. But what yeah. we... <laughs> what we, did, what we so, so, so this is the programme. This is the programme from... Which, sadly, they charged for... They used... Ugh, so many stories about what they... Because they charge for everything they can. But they used to give these away free. And it's a shame everybody in the country couldn't have one. Um, but this is the programme we created. And it's full, it's full of... Um, this is Gormley's Field of the British Isles. Field for the British Isles. And Gormley's got one on Formby Beach, hasn't he, at the yeah. moment? You know, it's like... So we wanted all these visual references as well, but everywhere we've got references to novels or writing, Shakespeare, and stuff like that. So, and it, you can probably have a look at this. It's Frank's copy, actually. I'm sure he'd yeah, love I'll you leave, to have a look at it. Leave it in the reader reading corner. Yeah, but there's lots of, there's lots of bits of, you know, pepper. There's loads of the seven politicians at the front who all insisted on being in it, which is really annoying. But more, because their stuff really isn't worth reading. It really is. You think, why read that? And t I kid you not, se so seven politicians, not a spiritual leader, not a trade unionist, no social workers, nobody who's actually actively involved in the community, just seven self-regarding politicians at the front of it. Anyway, enough of that. There's lots of good stuff and to Boris read. And Boris is in there as well. Eh? And Boris is in there. Boris is in there. <laughs> there's, lots of good, there's lots of good stuff to read. There's a wonderful thing by Frank um, in it as well. And... and so we get to this bit, which is the bit we just wanted to talk to you about, which is a very, kind of probably the most famous bit in it, which everybody loves, which is Happy and Glorious, which is the story of the Queen and James Bond, which is bringing, to, bringing together. So we sat down in this room and we said, right, what are the, what, what's world, because this is a worldwide show, what's worldwide famous, right, that's British? And we basically had three things. We had the Queen... James Bond, and despite what he's just said, David Beckham. Yeah. And it's true. <laughs> you know, and w there was a hidden one that we didn't realise at the time until we got Rowan Atkinson for the shop, which is Mr. Bean, is actually 
famous around well, the world, probably even more around the world than he is here, you know. So we thought um, about bringing two of those icons together. So we, and that was how we came up with the idea of the Queen and James Bond. And we can talk about that. I'm sure some of you will probably want to ask questions about that when we do questions and answers. But what we were going to print oh. in here was a poem to go with this picture. We didn't want it to be kind of the regular picture. She's got a regular picture at the front, you know, which is, which is what you'd expect. And that's the kind of, you know, and then there's the bloody seven politicians. It's just pages and pages of politicians. And then, but we wanted something, so we had this kid's drawing of it, because we wanted to humanise her, you know, to make her touchable. And she clearly wanted that, and agreeing to do the sequence, she clearly wanted that as well. And so we had this poem. And I'd, I'd said to Frank, I, a, a couple of years ago, probably when we started the Olympics, I'd given Frank this poem, which I'd, I knew this poet called Paul Farley, who's from here. And I'd given this poem, which is one of my favourite poems there is. When you get a bit older, read it, because you'll know what it means when you get a bit older. It's called Liverpool, Dis Liverpool Disappears for a Billionth of a, of a Second. second. The most amazing poem. Uh, it's in a book he wrote called Tramping Flames, which is another amazing poem. Anyway, so and it, we were going we were gonna print this poem about the Queen alongside that, and you'll realise at the end, as I read it, why we didn't, why we couldn't print it because of the last line. And um, I'll make an announcement. Yes, you've okay. got to make an announcement before um, I read this, it. Danny works in film. We both worked in film, and films have a certification system. And this poem would be a certificate 15. So if there's anybody here who's under the age of 15, that I don't want them to leave, but I will lift my hand up when you're supposed to cover your ears, and then I'll pick it down again. Okay? So anyone here who's under 15 or of a sensitive nature, I'll put my hand up. I couldn't do it. Okay, go on. So this is, the, this is called The Queen. We have a queen. We're living in a queendom. This country has its best times under queens. She brings out all the bunting and the courtiers, the peaceful demo and the strange headgear. She is a 50s queen in black and white, moving through the Commonwealth in newsreel. A 60s queen with a sister in the Bahamas. I'll talk to you about that separately, actually, if you want to talk about that. <laughs> so very interesting. A 70s queen with a safety pin through her nose. An 80s queen, eclipsed by a princess. A 90s queen, advised not to lose touch. And I have never known anything different. She runs the House of Windsor as the firm. If we work at it, the word queen will abrade to something strong and round and made of stone. She does the regal wave from helicopters. Her wrist orbits a well-worn ball and socket. On aerial view, she is a great authority. The landfill and the scars, the motorways, the shrunken hunting grounds, the sea drawn back to reveal the tidal extent of her realm. I couldn't do it. Imagine waking up in the blue silence of 700 rooms in a palace in the middle of a city and realizing, Jesus, I'm the fucking queen. <laughs> so you could tell why you're all right. <laughs> so this is, this is a Liverpool poet. He's a fantastic poet. And I thought, what an, we thought, what an amazing poem. That you, if you could put that on the page, beside it. But there'd be too much fuss because of that final line. And you couldn't also say to the writer, change that line, because he's used that line because he wants people to read that line and to laugh. Because you read it, and I remember reading it, and you laugh. And it's swearing used in a really good way because it's part of our language and it's a bit shocking for some people and I apologise for doing it in, in, a, in a faith house. But it's actually, it's part of our being and it's part of our reading and writing is, is part of that. And anyway, so we couldn't use it, so... Um, but that's what we wanted to put beside her. And I think it would have been an incredible tribute to her because actually meeting her and actually working with it, what you forget is that she is. She's, she's, just, she's, she's you. You know, she's just you. But she's also queen. It's like, it's this weird nightmare of 700 empty rooms <laughs> is where you live, you know. And, um, and you wanted, we wanted to humanise her as well because the whole thing about... And you find that... And I would encourage the Queen to read, <laughs> because there's a great quote about we read to know we're not alone. And if she ever wanted to know that she's not alone in that world of 700 empty rooms, you'd find that in reading, really. You'd find somebody to read who understood how you felt. And that's what you can always find. There's an amazing film, Milk. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Milk. 
There's an amazing bit in it where a boy, a little boy who's gay, and he's 14, and he, and he rings up Harvey Milk. And all they do is say to him, you're not alone, you know? And it's, it's finding that connection, which you can find through books and through chat lines as well, I know, but maybe not the chat lines, but... Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry. No, I was, gonna, like, I was just going to pick you up on two little things. One is a question I'm going to ask you in a minute. But also, like, what this poem does, I think, is take something incredibly familiar, the Queen. It could not be more familiar. She's on every stamp. She's part of our wallpaper. We don't notice her. And make her fresh and new. And that's what poetry does. It takes the things that are around you and makes you look at them in a new way. I love this. She does the regal way from helicopters. Her wrist orbits a well-worn bone and socket. Making you look at something that you're very familiar with and making it, you look anew. And that's another G.K. Chesterton quote, I'm sorry. Where he said, the world is not... Per and this is sort of where we got our title from. The world is not perishing for lack of wonders. The world is perishing for lack of wonder. And it's that thing of like making you look at the world that's already around you and making you own it and making you see that it is amazing. And I hope that's sort of what we did with the ceremony. So you took, that's what, when people say it made me feel patriotic, what we did was represent the culture that we all live in and say, look, it's amazing. You just forgot. You just, didn't, you just forgot to notice that you're amazing, that this is an amazing place. And the other thing is like, why did she say yes? How did we persuade the Queen to jump out of a helicopter? <laughs> To be in a sketch. How do we persuade him? Yeah. Well, we... we, we I, I kind of know, but like, people keep asking me that and... No, go on. No, can you tell me? Well, no, we... we well, so, well, we assumed... When we, we assumed... Um, we had this idea, obviously, that Bond would go in and, you know, pick her up for, you know, she's late or whatever for the... Because it's a part of the protocol, the opening of... You have to introduce the head of state to officially open the game. So it has to be in the show. You haven't got a choice about it. It has to be the head of state has to do it. And so we, assume, we, sent them, we sent them the idea and we assumed that there'd be two scenarios. The worst case scenario, that it would be no. Absolutely, under no circumstances, would that be a, an appropriate way to introduce her. And therefore, we just have to show her, I don't know, arriving in the black, lonely car and kind of going up the step, you know, and coming in the door. Um, or the, worst, the, the best scenario would be that she'd agree to have a double. And that, you know, you would see her and it would be a really good double. It wouldn't be that rubbish double you see on television sometimes. It would be a really good double. And then just as she turned around, you'd cut so you wouldn't see it was a double and not her. But in fact, she then sent word that she approved of it and that she'd actually like to be in it. If she could, and she'd actually like to say the lines as well. So that was how we got her. And she wanted to, but it's interesting, she wanted, I think the reason she wanted to do it is she wanted her... She, she had, some of the people who are her staff have been with her for a long time, obviously very loyal people. And she wanted them to be in it. They, she wanted them to meet Daniel Craig, you know, because he's a movie star and James Bond's a big thing. And, and she wanted them to have a day out, you know, that was, wasn't just op opening another, you know, town hall somewhere or whatever it is the, the days go by that you end up doing. And she wanted a bit of excitement, really, in the day, really, which she's, she could share with these people who look after her as well. There's a really tall guy in it called Paul, who's like a butler or something like that. He has some head butler title or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And he's in it, and she wanted him to be in it, and a corgis and stuff like that, you know, so to give them a bit of a day out. So, I suppose. <laughs> can you Is remember the names you... of the... Can... Yeah, that's how I remember. I remember that we asked for permission, and the message came back, yes, that's fine, she's available on the following dates. And we all kind of went, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. sh should we stop and let, let people ask questions? Yes, or? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do people want to ask questions? That We'd be, be delighted to, to answer your questions. Answer any questions that you've got.